In this episode of the Azure Essentials Show, uh, we're continuing our conversation with uh, two Microsoft uh, corporate vice presidents about generative AI and business transformation led by radical product innovation. So uh, let's jump back in. We're going to talk about readiness. We're going to talk about learnings. BJ Uli, thank you so much uh, and welcome back. I'm looking forward to, to diving back into where we left off on this initial session on the radical uh, product innovation um, in the R&D space. So uh, we're going to talk about readiness. We're going to talk about learnings uh, and I want to dive straight into it, right? So um, I want to ask you, what would allow a company to go for transformation by radical product innovation. I mean, what is the state of readiness? I mean, how to think about this? So the state of readiness that you see in a company uh, before they can uh, embark on this on this journey, uh, if, if we can start with you. Yeah, so Jacob, uh, welcome back and thank you again for inviting us to chat a little bit about this. So as all transformations are essentially about change management, it starts from me at the top. Uh, the top executive, the executive leadership of any company has to effectively embrace this change and give the signal to the rest of the organization that A, transformation is desired and B, innovation is um, on top of the, the goals. And any company that does do that is doing well. Any company where it doesn't do well, it's 50-50 chance if it wouldn't work or not. And so I think that's the number one issue. The second one obviously has to do with, are you ready for this innovation? AI innovation happens in the cloud. If you are not in the cloud at this point in time, how are you going to participate in this innovation? And therefore, you need to think about um, how to transform your IT organization to participate in the cloud, bring the data into the cloud. That's the third uh, element. So data is the fuel for AI. And while the internet fuels the large language models that are forming the foundation for generative AI, um, there is obviously a ton of value in customer data, in your own data that you have accumulated in research and other things we've talked about in the first episode. And so organizing that data, bringing it into the right shape um, in the technical term, it's called factorization, for example, so that you can bring the data into uh, the LLMs uh, or into the Gen AI systems so that they can work it. And then the other half of it is the people side. How do you get the people ready to go and work and use Gen AI? And that's really about how do you bring the innovation that is available today to your people so that they get used to working with AI as a companion, as a system that effectively is there to help them. And a great example is the Microsoft 365 Copilot, which is a product from Microsoft. Obviously, there's others out there in the industry that do similar things. <clears throat> and the 365 Copilot effectively helps you be more productive with your work documents, emails, PowerPoint presentations, and so forth. Effectively, in short, productivity for your personal uh, perspective or team's perspective. But the more important thing, at least for the radical innovation uh, part, is it gets people used to utilizing AI in a specific way. And I think that's really the change you want and the change you need. So from my perspective, that's where it gets gets together. You start with the top-down execs, you organize, you get into the cloud, you organize your data, and then you train your people, not by some old-fashioned training program, but have them use Copilot, have them use ChatGPT and those kind of capabilities. Now, Vijay, my friend, you have been thinking about machine learning and skills for a long, long time. Um, when you think about data science and the people that lead those data science capabilities, how have, how are they are embarking on that kind of radical journey? Yeah, thanks indeed, Uli. Uh, I mean, there was a time where, when we, before we considered or advised a company that they were ready for major AI work, it was like, how many data scientists do you have? How many machine learning PhDs do you have? Do you know all the latest tools like Keras and so on? But over the, since LLMs came out, and you know, 2019 really was when these things became uh, sufficiently interesting, we've not seen that having a large data science team is a gating factor. 
So some companies we worked with did have very strong data science teams. Some didn't. What we saw instead was, were the product conceptualizers themselves? Were they familiar with AI? Had they played in the, in the past with GPT-3 and GPT-3.5 playgrounds? And of course, since ChatGPT, everyone and co-pilots, everyone's been playing with them. So once they were able to conceptualize what generative AI can do in reasoning, and also how you have to guide it to get the right information, and how you cross-check it, and how you don't use it as an oracle, as a source of predicting the future, but you use it carefully. That really was what I found was the foundation of readiness. So once you actually have the people who are behind the innovation, the people who are the dreamers, and people who are the operationalizers, once they understand generative AI, and now you're playing with ChatGPT, you're playing with Copilot, and there are other tools out there. You're playing with them sufficiently. At that point, the brain changes. So I just give a very quick sort of contrast. You know, over the years, we saw enterprises become data, you know, data centric. That means I do not make a decision just based on, based on gut feel. I do not make a decision just based on me being an expert because I say so, but gather data business intelligence systems, search engines, and that's now become very much the norm in large enterprises. The next part is moving above data centricity to learning centricity. If my team, as Uli pointed out, has done some work in the past, or an affiliate has done some work in the past, what am I learning from it? Not just copying, what am I learning from it? So that really is the culture that really provides, if you like, the basis for readiness here. So it's not a technology readiness, it's more a readiness about how you think about a problem. Oh, th th thank you, uh, BJ and Uli. The, the, these are great perspectives. It's it sort of, it, 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 I wanna talk about how to operationalize it because I think that's that's a natural next step. Right? So so how does companies action this? I think that's, that's, the, that's the word I, I think is interesting. How do they action it? I mean, what's the blueprint? Uh, what's the pattern to follow? I mean, Vijay, you you and I have been partnering on a number of journeys to apply Gen AI in, in pharma, in energy, in carbon capture, cosmetics, uh, manufacturing. I mean, I can certainly see some patterns that are repeatable. But what do you think? What's your learnings here? Okay. So, look, uh, I, I've had to sort of uh, formalize these learnings because every time you have a new engagement, the whole point is learning-based, right? We want AI to be learning-based. We ourselves have to be learning-based. And I saw really five key steps. Uh, they weren't necessarily always all present, but these are the five steps I saw. The first, and this is really requires senior, senior leaders to get involved on day one, identify something that is sufficiently high reward. So I'm going to take an example. So let's take pharma. In pharma, let's say, and this is a well-known uh, sort of value uh, metric in pharma, let's say 10% reduction of cost in R&D has a 1x multiplier. So that's your base. Then reduction of risk of failure has perhaps 24x multiplier. Bringing forward of peak sales has 36x multiplier. I mean, it's a very unique environment. You have a window of selling because of patents. But the point is, they understand their value reward system. Now the question is, given all the uncertainties that happen when you're innovating products and the effort it takes to get generative AI adopted just correctly, why would you go for the 1x multiplier? It's not like you don't do that, but why would that be your North Star? Why would my North Star not be the 24X? So the first one is, if you aim for something that's sufficiently high reward, then even interim steps that are immature steps, you can start getting value in six months and 12 months as opposed to just wait. So that's the first one. That's really about how do you set this entire project forward? Okay, the next ones I'll go you know, much faster on. Point two is create measures for success. Well. Everybody already does that. I mean, everyone has business metrics, but 
with generative AI, you want business metrics that AI can also learn and improve upon. So if one of your metrics is more information from more sources is used within every decision to reduce risk, great business metric that foretells success, great metric to improve the AI itself. So align business with AI, because for the first time you have a system that knows how to improve. Okay. Third one is, and this is something, this is not a new phenomenon. We've seen that in Microsoft's history with you know, products that we every time we've democratized things all the way from Access, Excel, you know, Power Apps, three to 5% of people, let's call them mavens, the hungry people, they figure out how to get value from emerging technology. And you need really to provide mechanisms and incentives for those people to help others with templates, share my reasoning flow, and so on. The next one is think about data more intentionally. And we're going to discuss that in a future episode in more detail. But the data you have that you used to consider valuable, is that the only data that's valuable? What about all the digital exhaust that you used to discard? Is that valuable? And maybe some other data is not as valuable because that's available already in pre-training in the large learning models, large language models. Get intentional about data. And also for the first time with generative AI, you can synthesize data. You can create, you don't have to have encountered every in a bank that when you're doing wealth management, every single example of how to advise an ultra high net worth individual with different, you don't have to, you can generate those, of course. This care, care needs to be taken uh, in doing that. And the last one is, and this one, I'm not sure how intentional it was at the beginning, but I always see that happen. A culture of curiosity, but cautious curiosity. So let me explain what I mean by that. So Gen AI has been changing constantly, and we believe it will continue to improve over the next few years. So we don't set things in stone. We mm. create a culture for people and conversational models like in chat GPT and in, uh, uh, in co-pilots really encourage that. They encourage mm. people to discover new capabilities. But when you use new capabilities that are still immature, you need the culture of saying, let me test it against some ground truths. Mm. So that's really what I have seen mm. as a pattern. And of course, all the other goodnesses of you know, galvanizing your, your teams and incenting those. But I try to describe the five things that I think have really come to the fore because of generative AI. Mm. Yeah, Vijay, th th those are very, very interesting learnings. And, and I think, uh, and, and also, uh, Uli, thank you for, for, for sharing along the same line. So, so I guess it's, it's about creating a culture of explorers. I have this mental picture of, of, of people with headbands and machetes uh, that, that needs to, to go out and, and, and sort of plow the way for, 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 for thinking about or rethinking businesses. Uh, it's, it's extremely interesting. Uh, Uli, I want, to, um, I want to wrap this first session uh, by asking you this question. So what do you see, uh, or you see, let me ask it in this way, you see things across the enterprise. Right. So you're so broad, you focus on, on, on let's say, end-to-end. -end. How do you see radical uh, new products and services uh, change other parts of the company? Yeah, so when you look at it, product creation is obviously one part of the puzzle, and VJ has been very focused on that part of the piece. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the entire value chain that an enterprise uh, pr perspective drives, so we have the product part, but then we have the operations part. So we need to service the customer, we have a logistics chain, we have financial needs and other things. And all of those areas are now being supported by Gen AI. What it really means is the human beings, the people that perform these functions are supported by those, uh, those AI capabilities. So there will be a function uh, support capability for the service uh, person that is talking to clients. There is a support uh, agent for the CFO that effectively has to make strategic decisions about financial services. And then there will be a, a financial support team for the analyst that effectively drives it. So think 
when you look at Gen AI, don't just look at radical innovation in the product sense. I think that's mm -hmm. one angle, but really look at in the customer service area, in the supply chain, in the logistics, in the financial services, and in the productivity area for your people. Always remember 60% of an enterprise data comes from unstructured sources, which means us, people that write documents, that send email, Teams messages, conversations, all of this is effectively high value add that now can be harnessed to optimize uh, the various aspects of any organization. And I think that's really the key part of how the Microsoft co-pilots are evolving to support these various roles and tasks across an enterprise and how the partner ecosystem is also coming in to do the same kind of support. So if you're ordering things or if you're trying to um, raise an IT support ticket, all of that kind of um, process is now being AI augmented and AI supported, which I think is something uh, that's super exciting. As these capabilities become richer, again, Vijay talked about multimodal capabilities, um, we will see ever better capabilities where instead of you getting a dry response, let's say from a service agent, why the system doesn't respond with a custom created video for your specific scenario. So you can get a video that says, here's how you go and turn do not disturb on, uh, for example, as we were struggling with it uh, at the setup of the session. And so from my perspective, we need to really think entire enterprise, and then you will see the creation of amazing uh, productivity gains in addition to just narrow product uh, innovation. So it's a journey and partners uh, like Microsoft can help. We are doing this with our ecosystem, uh, be that ISVs like SAP ServiceNow or partners like Accenture, uh, Infosys and others that are effectively part of our journey. And this is a journey. I think the key is accepting it, engaging it and driving it. With that, we, I I want to draw us to a to a close, but it's just been fascinating. I, I want to thank you both for, for sharing your perspectives, uh, for sharing your learnings. Uh, I cannot wait for us to dive into uh, into the uh, into the next session. So thank you so much. Thank you indeed, Jacob. That, what a thrilling time to be in this industry. Thank you, Vijay. Thank you, Jacob. Great to see you and a fantastic chat. Wow, this is great conversations. I mean. Be sure to check out the other episodes in the AI Senate series of the Azure Essential Show. If you have any questions for myself, Uli, or BJ, be sure to leave them in the comment section below and we will get back to you. Until next time, thank you for watching the Azure Essential Show.